Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks podcast by the New Art School. Our guest today is Carl Swan. Welcome, Carl. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. Tell us about you and your work. Well, I've been a graphic or typographic designer for 50 years. I started out at art school when I was 16 years old, and uh, that was quite a new experience, coming from a, an all-boys grammar school with uh, then getting into an art school in the 1950s in England with all those beautiful, big-bosomed girls, you know. It was quite a shock and nice shock, yeah. Uh, Fantastic. I thought that... Um, Typography was a comparatively untouched field. Uh, certainly in, term, in, in the 1950s, it was, you know, nobody had heard of a typographic designer. In fact, nobody had really heard of designers. Um, but in my art school, we just got a, a new teacher of typography who was straight out of industry. Uh, Leicester, my hometown, was it? Uh, fortunately for me, quite a good centre for printing. And I did uh, three units of typography and uh, developed the units and, and taught them. But I was still doing uh, writing, typing and printing, in a sense, because what I obviously had to change to was uh, writing or texting and uh, printing off the, off the computer and then designing on a much broader scale for mass communications. I, I developed that writing, typing, uh, and designing into a project where I got the students to write a letter to a personal friend about something that they felt very uh, emotional or passionate about. And uh, the students were required to write that letter uh, or use it in digital form as a text message. Um, they were then asked to, instead of writing just to their personal friend, where they knew that friend and how to communicate with them, that they would have to write to a newspaper uh, on the same kind of issue same, and try and persuade a more general readership and the last exercise, they, they didn't know what they were doing until they got to the, each stage. And the last exercise was to design a T-shirt with the same message on. So they had a lot of different forms of expression and technology uh, with the same message. And I had one bright student at, um, at, at, in South Australia, the University of South Australia, uh, Peter Green, and he... Uh, he wrote a, a lovely letter to a personal friend, and it was about suicide. His, his friend had had thoughts about suicide, and he wrote a very uh, passionate, moving letter to persuade his friend not to get involved with that. He then wrote uh, a bright letter to the newspapers to try and put uh, a wider emphasis on all of this. And then uh, he was surprised when the last exercise was to make a, a T-shirt out of this. And he was the only student who didn't submit on the last presentation of the T-shirts. And I was surprised because he's, I knew he was a good and able student. Mm -hmm. And he came to me after and said, I, I, I didn't think you'd take my design, my idea for this. And I said, try me. And he said, well, I... I was thinking about my friend again, and he said, I, I, I had a T-shirt, uh, but it wasn't a message on the front. It was a label on the back, inside, which said, think well of yourself when you wear this T-shirt. I thought it was brilliant. And uh, um, Peter went on to do a good career in design, of course. But I, I thought that was fantastic, uh, poetic, virtually, in concept. And uh, 
it kept me going with the with that project because I thought, well, if in fact if someone can come up with that idea, it's not a bad project. <laughs> Absolutely. You also said something about letter to a friend, email to a, to a newspaper, T-shirt. This is this is the one you talked about uh, right now. Um, Sorry. You said you said letter to a friend, email to newspaper, T-shirt. This this is the one you talked about, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the distance learning strategies. So, but but between Manchester, what so what happened after Manchester? Ah, well, I I got the job as head of design, head of graphic design at uh, North Staffs College, which was really only down the road about fifty miles, mm-hmm. and uh, it was halfway between Manchester and Birmingham, uh, and it was a new, you know, been a small art school that had been merged into two large technical colleges in 1970. That was in the setting up of polytechnics throughout the United Kingdom. And uh, I became head of the graphics at, again, the right time, because uh, from the swinging 60s, and in Macmillan's uh, wonderful phrase of the swinging 60s, the rich 60s, uh, we, we went into the 1970s, with a reasonable amount of money. So expansion was very much uh, the key to education at that time. And the Polytechnics wanted to expand like that. So uh, the graphic design course that I went to only had an intake of 15 students a year. That's, that's about as small as you, you, know, you can get. Yeah. Um, and there was a moratorium on, on the number of students that you could have in art and design. But that did change after a few years. And, and what we developed in conjunction with the, the regional Her Majesty's Inspector, a man named Dick Hiley, was to introduce a multidisciplinary design course. So what happened was we put together the three-dimensional design department, which was largely ceramics, of course, in stoke on Um And the graphic design, which we'd expanded into... Uh, illustration, typography, and uh, audiovisual. Uh, we expanded it all into this multidisciplinary design course, and uh, in the end, we were taking in 120 students. So there was a that was quite a significant enlargement of art and design, in uh, which went on, I think, in, in a lot of places. With the polytechnics, there was a lot of expansion time, and I was there for. I mean, I'd moved around quite a lot in the early stages, and uh, in Stoke on Trent, I was there for eleven years as head of the school of design, of graphic design, um, and we, you know, it was also uh, a place where I lived for quite a long time. <clears throat> It was all quite exciting at uh, North South, but it, it, um, I felt I needed something new and a new challenge. And when the post of head of design at um, St. Martin's School of Art in London came up, I applied for that and, again, surprised myself by getting it. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that was really quite a, a step up from Stoke on Trent. No, I mean, nobody wanted to know about Stoke on Trent. Oh. Uh, not really, except people, uh, potters did, of course, uh, ceramics people. But uh, Stoke on Trent, as a, as a design, as a graphic design centre, was you know, not, on the, not on the map. St. Martin's School of Art in Covent Garden, central London, was a different kettle of fish altogether. Mm-hmm. And I found that um, the newspapers and uh, campaign papers were coming to me to comment on whatever was happening. Um, and I was saying the same things that I was saying when I was up in, Man- in, in Stoke on Trent. Um, but suddenly it was a London voice and uh, got some publicity. <laughs> it's, it's very London centric, uh, is, is the UK. 
But it was interesting and it was great. I loved to be in uh, Covent Garden. Uh, it was a different world. It was amazing, really. Uh, the sort of things that happened because it was London and it was on Covent on a long acre in Covent Garden. And we had these um, on the ground floor of this old uh, 1920s warehouse building. There was um, a, a nice win shop window, and we had a technician who used to hang student work up in there. And we, uh, because of a guy named Richard Doust, who was very good on the, as mm -hmm. a long time member at um, at St. Martin's, Richard had introduced computer graphics and the students were printing stuff out on these long sheets of graph paper. Um, and some guys from Macintosh, Apple Macintosh, <laughs> walked by, saw this stuff, came in and said, would you like half a dozen Macintoshes to play, you know, give to the students to play with? We'd love to see what they do with it. And, well, you know, would we? Uh, it was quite something to be in the middle of London where that kind of thing could happen. Um, it would never happen in stoke on Trent. Absolutely. So you went to become head of department? And, and then? Well, I was um, head of St. Martin's for a while. And then we had this terrible thing of um, we had to merge courses with the central school. Now, it wasn't terrible, you know, being central school, but trying to totally reorganize the different ethos of teaching approaches in two different schools. I mean, central school had been there for uh, Yonks and so on, uh, St. Martin's for that matter. And we were challenged with uh, having to reduce courses in central London. And what, they, what the, uh, the London Authority decided to do was to combine courses rather than lose them. So our uh, situation was that we would have to combine the two graphic design courses at Central School and St Martin's and also combine the two fine art courses. So that way we would reduce two courses in, in London. And this why, were, why were these two courses combined? Well, uh, the uh, National Advisory Body had said that we must reduce courses in, in London. There, there were too many. And there was really, you know, it was an instruction. It was a government instruction, basically. So London, instead of you know, maybe closing uh, Camberwell and, uh, you know, um, Chelsea School of Art or whatever, yeah. which they could do, um, combined courses instead. So uh, it got rid of courses in name, at least, and number, um, but we were left with the problem of having to combine two different graphic design courses, two heads of departments, two different staff teams, and we had to do it within a year of uh, because if we didn't do it and get it organised, the CNA was not going to recognise the course, and we would not be allowed to take in any students, uh, but there would be quite a problem of staff redundancies and uh, uh, chaos. Uh, and we had this incredible problem, really, of uh, trying to align two different courses into, into one large course. Uh, eventually, I was put in charge of the course leader of the new course, and we, we did actually get approval from the CNEA, and things went okay. Um, I'd been very crafty and taken advantage of a new Department of Education and Science ruling that um, wanted to ensure that 
teaching staff were better qualified. You know, most of us at my age <clears throat> had only had a, a national diploma, which was you know, nothing really compared to uh, the degrees that were being handed out. Uh, and it was a, a little bit of amusement that uh, most of us who only had uh, a national diploma to our names were now organising courses which were including Masters of Design and so on, yeah. which was um, very strange. So what the Department of Education and Science were doing were offering um, grants for staff to up their qualifications. Now, I was, by that time, very interested in uh, typography with language. And so I had arranged with a sympathetic uh, London Education Authority inspector, Norman Birch, I had arranged that if we were successful in getting this course approved, then I would bugger off and do a year on an MA in linguistics at Lancaster University, which actually was terrific. I, I loved it. Uh, it was a challenge, and uh, it was very different, the academic study that I did. But that was, uh, it was terrific because I, it was just what I wanted. Uh, the professor of linguistics in Lancaster was a man named uh, Chris Canlin, and he was a very widely... Uh, Catholic kind of linguist and I mean his comment to me when I went for an interview was how interesting to have a visual artist in our midst uh, you know this is going to be a very challenging year for both of us um, and he's superb and he had some terrific people there but, uh, partly because the University of South Australia was a combination of uh, college, college of Advanced Education, which was a teacher training college. And uh, there were some very good educationists there. When they started up the distance education, uh, which was basically a correspondence course in those early days, uh, they got very good at it. The strategies of how you approach with that long distance a uh, lonely person sitting in their own room and getting their material through the post was quite a challenge. Um, when I went to, I, I actually launched uh, the first MA, postgraduate design course, through that method basically with, with um, books, readings, Tapes, recordings, you know, um, the whole works um, with the University of South Australia. When I went to Perth, part of their attraction to me was that I'd had that kind of experience. And Perth is the most isolated city on the planet. So that, um, you know, distance learning had to be a major development for them. And they'd already got lots of courses going that way. But, I, um, of course, the, the situation had changed because it was 1996 and uh, the Internet was developing. Yeah. And, and so we concentrated on putting this correspondence course into a format that could be delivered through the Internet. Um, and I, I, I do find that kind of thing... Uh, is attractive, is a challenge. Um, most of my colleagues uh, didn't want to get interested because they thought you could only teach design in a classroom in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know how to do it when we, when we started. But the head of the distance education centre, uh, Bruce, was very persuasive and, and told me that there was no subject in the world that could not be taught by distance learning. Um, and he quoted um, uh, the man from South Africa who became the president of South Africa. 
um, that he he taught, he, he was taught by distance learning mm. uh, to become a lawyer and, uh, you know, virtually everything he knew was, was uh, through his imprisonment. Nelson Mandela, yeah. That's right. Um, he, he was um, educated through distance learning techniques. So it was a challenge. And I found that, well, you, uh, of course, it was different for postgraduate. And that was a good place to start because you don't have to teach the basics. These people have got a degree. They've probably got uh, the students were, were qualified and they had some experience. Um, so it was a different proposition. And most of the master's work was much more theoretical. And um, it was it was easier in that respect. And I do think it's a problem um, to teach uh, through distance education means to students who don't know anything. You know, they're starting out. I did have yeah. experience with that with the uh, typography teaching which I did for the last uh, umpteen years. When I retired in 2001, I, we did a tour of um, Australia, you know, four-wheel drive and uh, tents and all the rest of it. Um, and then I went to live in Denmark for two or three years. And when I came back to Australia, I started uh, doing the online teaching, which I only gave up in 2019. So, uh, obviously, it is difficult. And um, one has to adapt the way one teaches. If your students are not going to be able to sit in front of you and uh, have something you can do in five or ten minutes yeah. with a pencil, with a student, you can't do in uh, distance learning. You, you've got to construct it in a different way. So how did you, what did you change? Um, well, I still use the, uh, the writing, typing, and printing model. Um, and that seemed to work reasonably well because we, we'd moved on to uh, text messages and email. Uh, and a T-shirt is still a T-shirt, so that um, the, the situation was easier to do. And I also did, um, I got them to work with materials again using the concertina fold of the Chinese book which they had to produce and present as a photograph, uh, both as an as a in-design uh, PDF, uh, but also photograph the object so that they, we, could, we could assess it as a, in the round. Um, so yes, when I, when I had to do it with the second-hand use of photography and uh, um, digital formatting, Not so easy. Sorry? It wasn't so easy. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Not so successful, I know. Hmm. What would be the principles of your new school? What, what principles would you, would you have in, 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 your, in, in, the, in the school that you will make? I think it would be around um, teaching typography with a stick in the sand. Um, <clears throat> I think it would be uh, still hands-on with drawing and uh, typography and a lot of uh, theoretical input on language and media and communication, really graphic images. Um, it would be a lot more theoretical and cerebral, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would still expect to construct in a way that would uh, have students 
Dublin and getting their hands wet with meeting things. Yeah. I think that's very important. Yeah. And who would be the people that would influence you, the designers or the educators that would influence you? Oh, I think so many. Uh, so many designers. Mm. Uh, I, I got to know Alan Fletcher quite well. Yeah. And uh, I just had so much respect for Alan. I visited him in his studio in uh, in, in, in Holland Park, and um, he was he was a gentleman, um, but he he had a vision and an insight into how to do things. Uh, I think Alan Fletcher would would uh, be a person I would look up to. But I think there's, there's a lot. Um, my friend in Germany, Olaf Loy, is a year younger than me. Um, he's now the oldest friend um, I have. Um, I'm afraid many others have uh, gone by the wayside, but Olaf, he's the one who calls us veteran typographers. Okay. And uh, he, I've used uh, a, a, a short piece that he wrote to me on email, uh, and I, I've closed my book with his um, his thoughts about design uh, because I think he's he's really very very smart, and he's put design into the context of uh, it's something which we do. It's ephemeral, it's gone, and when our careers are finished, you know, we're finished. We're, there's nothing else. It's not a scientific discipline. Um, but I thought his he was very perceptive about the way design is, and um, I've concluded my own book with his uh, articulation of, of these thoughts. Yeah. A any advice you'd like to leave us with for students and for designers and for teachers? What would be your advice? Uh, that's that's uh, a tough one. Um, the only thing you can do is to put every effort in. I mean, I consider design as a, as a fairly fly-by-night thing. Um, but even if you, you do think of it as an ephemeral, and not so very important thing. I would mention when I went to the University of South Australia, the School of Design there was very, very efficient and very good, and the quality of students, the graduates, were really superb. Um, but all the staff thought design was the most important thing in the world. And when I pointed out that the building next door to us, was the nursing building, and that they actually did deal with more important things like life and death. Uh, I was almost lynched by the design team. <laughs> um, this was sacrilege. So I've, I've got a sort of, um, I think, a healthy respect or disrespect for design. But at the same time, to do anything, you've just got to put the whole effort into I, I certainly have. I'm, I've got to put every thought, every fiber of my being, even if it's only uh, a concert advertisement for the local school, you know, for the kids' school. It's, it's um, you, you, you have to work very hard at it. And the more you know about communication, the better chance you've got of finding the right kind of idea. But you've also got to have the hands-on experiment, the artistic stuff. Uh, it's a, it's a multi-tasking kind of activity, uh, as all design activities are. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this talk. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be in touch, of course, for, for everything else. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's been interesting to meet you. I'm sorry, that's good. <laughs>